Scripture reading today will come from Psalms, Psalm 73. Psalm 73, verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Good morning to all of you. Beautiful Lord's Day morning. Thankful for the opportunity to assemble together on this Lord's Day, first day of the week, last Lord's Day, the month of January. We're always grateful for the opportunity to assemble together and to worship God. In the last hour, that was ours to come together to study the Bible in all of our different classes. Now as we assemble together in this room, in this auditorium, The sanctuary is meeting in this room. Think about it like that. Quite often, if you've noticed the bulletin for a third time, as JP mentioned, uh, this sermon has been put off a couple of times. I hope it did not build the hype in it too much. It's just uh, once it was not fully ready in the way that I wanted it to be, and then last week with the weather, I decided to delay it again. But I'm indeed grateful to JP and leading the songs that he did and selection and going along with the lesson. And that is speaking of each song and showing us how they tie into the lesson. But if you notice the bulletin on sanctuary, one of the questions was, is there a sanctuary today? And there is. It's not the building as many people would call it. There's nothing about this room, but it is we, the people, Christians. We are God's sanctuary. Just as JP led us in that song a moment ago, make me a sanctuary. And that's what we're going to study today in Psalm chapter 73, if you'd like to. And leave your Bible open to Psalm chapter 73. We'll reference some other verses. We'll conclude in Hebrews at the end of the lesson. But for the most part, we're right here in Psalm chapter 73 today. And I'll mention this if you're taking notes. We're not going to introduce the minor prophet Habakkuk, three chapters, the minor prophet. We're not going to talk about, well, I might mention them, but we're not going to introduce that book or read it. But uh, it's interesting if you read this chapter Psalm 73, and the book of Habakkuk, the three chapters there, the similarities that the psalmist came away after turning to God and the man, the prophet Habakkuk, came away once he turned it over to God. So today we're going to talk about God's sanctuary. Sanctuary, and just a a quick, easy to remember definition, a place made holy by God's presence. A place made holy by God's presence. You see the presence of God a number of times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. You see the burning bush with Moses in the book of Exodus. Take off your shoes for this is holy ground. There's nothing holy about that place until God appeared there. We'll wrap our lesson up a little later in talking about the sanctuary of the tabernacle and the temple. A place made holy by God's presence. Let's notice this chapter together. First of all, in the first 16 verses, Psalm chapter 73, verses 1 through 16, you see the problem. And I went back and forth and asked, trying to decide what uh, scripture reading to give uh, Paxton. But I wanted to just leave it with that one verse because verse 17 is our focus. But let's begin in Psalm chapter 73 and verse 1. And we're going to notice, first of all, the problem that was at hand. In verse 1, the psalmist said, Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. In this first verse, all is, is well, all is understanding. Psalm chapter 73 and verse 1, he recognizes the goodness of God. But from verses 2 through 16, we're going to get into the problem. The problem that would be there. First of all, verses 2 through 11, the problem is that the psalmist is recognizing the wicked people around him, much like Habakkuk did. The psalmist is recognizing the prosperity of the wicked, the prosperity of the evil, and this is causing a problem for him. 
in verse 2, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. Now remember in verse 1, he's recognizing the goodness of God, but in verse 2, he's, he's changing his focus to himself. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious. Here's your problem. The Bible from beginning to end tells us to not envy. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, for example, in that love chapter, we're to not envy. He said, I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This goes along with this problem. He's noticing that God is good, verse 1, but that is not keeping his full attention. He's recognizing the people around him. He's recognizing their prosperity. And he is envious of them. In verse 4, for there are no death, there are no pangs in their death, and their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongues walk through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Again, very much like Habakkuk in the Minor Prophet uh, book, as he is searching out the problems of life, as he's trying to understand the problems of life, the psalmist in these verses recognizes all of the people around them. But we'll notice that the problem does not end there. Uh, for him, the problem is going to get a little deeper because first of all, he's, he's choosing to look away from God and look out to the people. And I saw what they were doing. Now, beginning in verse 12, verses 12 through 14, we're going to see where he's going to compare himself to them. In verse 12, he said, Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. You see the comparison. Why am I doing this? Why, why am I getting up and getting ready and going to church on Sunday? Why am I spending my time here? Why am I doing it on Wednesday night? Why am I reading the Bible daily? Why am I trying to do right? Why am I trying to speak with godly language and, and, and act and react in godly kindness? Look at everybody around me. Comparing what they're doing and they seem to have a better life than me. The psalmist is noticing the wicked and their prosperity. And he says in verse 13, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. So again, the problem is he's taking his focus off God. In verses 15 and 16, we notice the problem gets a little deeper. And he's trying to understand it for himself. If I had said, I will speak thus. Behold, I would be untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. And again, isn't it amazing the way that the Bible just keeps fitting together? I've already mentioned a couple of times how this psalm fits right into the book of Habakkuk. But does it not also fit into the study that we're having in the auditorium on Wednesday night, Solomon and Ecclesiastes. Isn't it the same thing? It's just amazing how it all fits together. But now we make a transition in verse 17. And in comes God's sanctuary. In verse 17, a short verse that Paxton read for us a moment ago, we're going to notice three valuable lessons from this one verse in verse 17 when the psalmist goes into the sanctuary. Verse 17, notice up to verse 16, it's a problem for him. But in verse 17, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Notice, first of all, the access. The, the psalmist here 
is, is dealing with this problem of noticing the people around him, noticing the wickedness, noticing their prosperity, comparing his life to their life, and he's coming away, and it's too painful for me to understand it. Verse 17, once again, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. We see, first of all, access. Now, is it not amazing that God, who created all of this world in the heavens, when you think about the world, you think about the atmosphere, you think about the solar system, you think about all the other planets, you think about the galaxy and the galaxies, you think about how awesome God is, how amazing God is, how when you think about the, the design of the human body, and he spoke all of this into his existence in six days. I believe it could have happened in a, in a twinkling, in a moment of an eye. I think the reason he chose to take six days is to put into motion what we need for time. In our 24-hour days, in our seven days week, he need, that was for that purpose. But, but, but even at that, is it not amazing that God could speak us into existence? He spoke the world into existence. He spoke the, 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 the plants and the trees into existence. He spoke the animals into existence. He spoke mankind into existence from the dust of the earth. And then woman coming from man's rib. Is that not truly amazing? Now, if you were to write a story and you're wanting to sell a bestseller or you're wanting to produce a movie uh, that would break all of the records and, and you imagine, be careful how I say this. Suppose we're talking about not Jehovah God, but, but someone that you've come up with, but yet you give him, this, this God that you've created, all the credit that is true that, that, that God has done. The story is probably not going to end in the same way that the Bible teaches us about God. Because you're going to focus more on that power of dictatorship. That power of do it exactly the way I say it or I'm going to destroy you and destroy your worlds. What I'm trying to get at here, when we think about how awesome our God is and how powerful he is, but yet... We have access to him. He wants that relationship with us. From anywhere you are in this world, God is there. And he's granting us access to him. We see also in verse 17, vision. Uh, again, the psalmist said, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Uh, you, you, you must consider the first 16 verses where the psalmist is troubled. He has a problem. I don't understand what's going on. I'm trying to do right and the wicked are prospering. It hurts me to try to understand it. I can't understand it on my own. But in verse 17, he has vision. He goes into the presence of God. He goes into the sanctuary of God. And now he's looking at life differently. He's no longer looking at the people around him and how they're prospering and the wickedness and all that's going on. Now he's looking at it through God's eyes. Now he has a, a different understanding of life, a different view on life. And again, this ties into Habakkuk. It ties into Solomon and Ecclesiastes. It ties into the Bible. He now has a different, and that's what, that's what God can do for us today. When we spend time in his word, in the Bible, when we spend time studying the Bible, it helps us to have a completely different view of life, a different vision, a different perspective in life here and eternity with God. But I don't really like to pick favorites. If I had to pick favorites, the third point from verse 17 is my favorite. The blessings. Notice again. Until I went into the sanctuary, the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. 
I want you not out loud, but in your mind, I want you to think of one blessing. I'm going to give you three seconds. Was your blessing that you thought of a thing or a person maybe? Most likely, when we think of blessings, we think of T-H-I-N-G-S. Thing. I do. I'm not condemning you if that's what popped up in your head. I do. But it's this chapter, this verse that opened my world, opened my eyes, a vision. What about the usually never appreciated blessings? That which we don't always see. Notice again verse 17. The focus is that word understood. Then I understood the blessing of understanding. I'm dealing with this problem. The wicked all around me, they're prospering. I'm trying to do right, but why? I'm comparing my life to them and it's hurting me to understand it. As we notice in verses 15 and 16, it hurts me to try to understand it. But let me enter into the sanctuary of God now I understand the blessing of understanding. The blessing, you know, in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, eight times in the New King James text, eight times the psalmist talks about how the word of God helps us to understand. Some of you have been in the church for all of your life and perhaps you got to a point, maybe with age and Bible knowledge, that you began to understand something that you used to not understand. Some of you converted to the church later and maybe at that point it's just a whole new world has opened up to you and you're reading the Bible and you have a completely different view, a completely different understanding of life. An understanding of life is one of the greatest blessings that we enjoy. We release ourselves from so much hurt and heartache and sorrow and stress. It doesn't mean that we're completely exempt from it. That's not to say that at all. But when we understand through the word of God, then we release ourselves from so much of this baggage that other people are holding on to because they can never understand separated from the sanctuary. What were the results? He goes into the sanctuary he has vision. He, he's looking at life differently. He, go, he has access to the sanctuary. God allows it. And he has an understanding. What were the results in the rest of the chapter, verses 18 through 28? Now he has peace. Now, now there's this peace that he, in verses 1 through 16, the peace is not there. But in verses 18 through 28, there's peace. Why is there peace? That one verse, verse 17 if you're outlining the chapter, here's your three-point outline. The problem, verses 1 through 16. The pivot, verse 17. And then the peace, verses 18 through 28. Now the peace was there all along. God was there all along. It took the psalmist having to decide to get away from the world, get away from all of this other stuff, enter into the sanctuary. Oh, now I understand. And the results coming out on the other end, and you can read those verses for yourself. He's at peace because he's looking at life completely different. Let's go to the New Testament book of Hebrews now as we make application to Christianity. Hebrews chapter 8. Remember we said in the beginning... Sanctuary, simple definition, a way to remember it is a dwelling made holy by God. And you can study, of course, the book of Exodus and read and remember the tabernacle and then eventually the temple when Solomon be builds the temple. But the Hebrews writer sums it up for us and we'll allow him to do this uh, this morning. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Who served the copy in the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. Then indeed even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. 
talking about the law of Moses, the first covenant, the earthly sanctuary, that building they went into. The tabernacle was a tent-like structure. They could take it down and move it. The temple was permanent. Verse 2, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So you see how, again, the Bible fits together. You have God's plan in giving the sanctuary in the form of a tabernacle in the book of Exodus, the beginning of the law period of time, the beginning of the mosaical period of time. And what do you have in the beginning of the New Testament period of time? God giving a sanctuary. Again, not a building. Wonderful to come to this place and this location. But the church, the people. Notice if you go back to the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Is there a sanctuary today? Absolutely there is, but it's not a building. It's what the Lord has given us. Even Stephen talked about that when he was being stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. It's not a building made with hands. It is, it is what the Lord has given us. We, God's people, when we enter into the kingdom of God, we are, we are sanctified. We are set apart. We are in God's sanctuary. Paul, twice Paul talks about that in the Corinthian letter. 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 6 about how we are the temple of God. We are God's sanctuary. So think with me for a moment as we draw our lesson to a close. When you think back to that one verse in verse 17. Up to that point in that psalm, the psalmist was confused. He was troubled. But he, was, he, he had no one to blame other than himself. Really. Again, life has its ups and downs. But, but we see that he was not turning to the source where he needed to turn to. And then in verse 17, that one verse, until I went into the sanctuary, then I understood their end. Until we draw near to God, James chapter 4, and keep drawing near to God, we won't understand life. We won't understand God. We won't understand the events of life. We won't understand eternity. It's up to each of us to draw near to God. We're going to sing a song of encouragement at this time. Perhaps you need to enter into God's sanctuary as a believer, repenting of your sins. The Bible teaches us you can be baptized into it. It's when the Lord will add you to his sanctuary, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. We must remain in it and faithfully serve in it all of life. And we must continue to do so. And then we'll have a peace that passes understanding, Philippians chapter 4. A peace that leads us all the way into heaven. There's no greater place on earth than in God's sanctuary with God's people going to heaven together. If we can help you this morning to go to heaven, please come as we stand and as we sing.